Hi, I'm Andrew Capra and I'm here with Johnny Liberty, sculptor extraordinaire. We're going to get drunk and ask some questions. What, what is your practice like? Uh, my practice consists mainly, uh, what I'm known for is riding on trees. Why trees? Uh, well, why trees? I write on trees because uh, I want to create a portrait of thought through documenting a thought process. Which sounds like a real koan, a real Zen koan, but in fact, it's sort of what happens when I'm being conscious and writing and embedding and I'm messing with the idea of writing and I'm using letter punches um, and a small hammer and then each piece is covered with thousands and thousands of letters that are a sort of run-on sentence. And I'm sort of messing with these ideas of liter literary cognitive theory um, how someone is writing, um, what affects that writing emotionally, or what affects the creativity, where is that coming from, what is at its root, to use our tree lingo. And language, of course, is all about branching, and uh, branching structures. And uh, the more you look into branching and branching structures, uh, the more you see that there's a self-similarity, pretty much, that permeates all of existence, which is this branching structure, one single thing, moving into more complex things. And that comes out in my writing in many different ways, which uh, attempts to tackle almost the psychology behind human creation and writing and thinking, delving into things. But it all wraps around quite literally these branches, these tree branches that I write on. Right. It seems like a very uh, sort of patient stream of consciousness sort of method of writing. Well, this is the irony. I mean, the first pieces were automatic, which was almost a kind of joke because, of course, trying to write automatically one letter at a time, with a hammer and a little letter puncher, almost like a little chisel. You'd have to remain constantly cognizant of what you're writing. It's very difficult. Right. It's very difficult. So things shift around quite a bit more, and there's actually this challenge to anything fluid going on. Um, but there's no punctuation either. And so everything, each moment lapses into the next as I'm consciously shifting and trying to follow along to some kind of narrative that eventually unfolds, which came out of me trying to focus on the work, focus on the writing. And uh, being challenged by the uh, yeah the methodologies of. So, do you think of your work as like a, a continuation of the stream of consciousness writing that was pioneered by James Joyce and later the Beat Generation? Do you think that with a typewriter it's simpler, and then you're trying to even reduce that? I think I'm playing with a literalness. Okay. Which is a kind of, obviously all of this stuff, stream of consciousness is an idea developed in early modernism and carried through into contemporary postmodern work that really chops it up like you're, um, well, any, anybody, everybody's having fun now in writing, which is great. But the rules have been uh, thrown away. But I like the idea of literary constraint. So for me, my constraint is my method. And that's what differs, is in my method, I'm, I'm hindered. And everything becomes either sluggish or some days I'm driven. Either way, it's, it's this very workable mentality. And it sort of throws, um, throws a nod at or gives homage to the actual history of sculpture and the history of writing. Where they branch, where they connect, is in ancient hieroglyphic writing. And in ancient writings in general, you have, um, you have the chisel at work in pretty much all proto-language across the world. It's these forms, whether it's animals or half-human, half-man mythologies, it's all unfolding from this base, which is uh, this chisel and the de this descriptor that I've conflated into this single act of punching this letter into this wood um, 90,000 times, 80,000 times, 50,000 times, just time and again, hammering it home, and then playing with different possibilities within that writing context. So for one piece, for instance, it was all about uh, dreams. So I was, I was gathering dreams from people in different ways, having them send me letters, having them type on, um, on typewriters, old typewriters, having them write it on notes, whatever, text it to me. And I collected about uh, 16 or 17 dreams, and then intermingling between these dreams, I had this narrative that was being affected by those dreams. So it was kind of interesting that the false narrative that I was creating was being fed from these dream experiences people were having. And so it was playing with the psychology of unconscious and conscious processes and stitching it all together. And that was just one example of a sort of thought experiment I did with this documenting a thought process thing I've been doing. I think it's all about, for me, direct and, direct and indirect processes of communicating. 
and implicit or explicit ways of seeing. So whether the person realizes it or not initially is always great, like always entertaining for me. <clears throat> Someone comes into the space and they see a branch. I'm like, okay, some weird nature lover has put a tree branch in the middle of this space. Oh, how nice. And then they get closer and they realize that there's thousands and thousands of characters embedded in it. And there's this moment, this revelatory moment, where there's like a cerebral flash and their whole get head goes, what? Oh my goodness, there's like 50,000 letters on this branch. What is going on here? And this whole inquiry follows where they go and try to decipher the material. But everyone gets these little snapshots, this indirect glimpse at what I've been doing. And the entire story remains only with me because I don't publish the stories at this point. So there's this hidden element, which for me is about sort of indirect access to an artist's thoughts or inspirations. And maybe on some level it's almost stage fright. Maybe I don't want to put my work out there that way, but at the same time it's almost more direct because it's direct to the wood, directly to a tree as opposed to mashing the tree into little bits and turning it into a page and then putting ink on that page and printing it through a digital process and then uh, having it circulate. Uh, this is like, for me, this sort of truth in this is taking all of this information and material, putting it in this format, and then it becomes a sculpture, and it has a certain limit to its accessibility. Not to not be universal, because in a sense, all artworks have this universality to them if they're within a space and people have access to them. But then there's this question of access, definitely, that keeps coming up in my work and in writing in general. And I think that has to do with human consciousness. How much are we hiding? How much are we letting, letting out to the world? And in a way, it's like, I guess, uh, when lovers carve their names in a tree, their initials or something, or surrounded by a heart, you're, you're sort of inviting people to come towards the tree and uh, reveal to them your uh, affection for nature and, moreover, your experiences with the world. And you're trying to reduce it as just a man-to-nature to sort of relationship. But within it, you're talking about I'm, all of the I'm sort of... I'm completely like, trying to abolish... Things. I'm trying to abolish any kind of dichotomy between man and nature. I think that's like a, at the genesis of everything I'm doing is this dichotomy that I feel is completely absurd and completely imagined and it's just a conceptualized uh, dichotomy that isn't really true. I mean you're as much a tree as the branch over there outside the studio. You're, uh, you're filled with bifurcating structures, pumping your blood, neuro depolarization of the synaptic cleft. It's all happening, all inside you right now. Um, billions and billions about 89 billion synapses are firing and your brain is just pumping out all this cool chemical energy and, and it's facilitating your consciousness here, which is really kind of a way of undermining going into the scientific idea behind all of this, but um, that's what I want to pay homage to because if you realize that there's a tree inside you and then wait, the <coughs> light, the photons coming into your eye actually on the back of your eye, the retina is actually a splayed sort of form, a little grid that is uh, again tree structured and is uh, these bifurcating vascular stems coming out of the center of the eye where you have your optical nerve and it goes back, it flips around at the chiasm and comes back around your occipital lobe, then you get all these fun pictures in your head, this little filmmaking is going on all through this process and all of this is facilitated by these tree structures. There's a great archaeological find that I really love called uh, Seahenge. You know, what's oh. interesting is it's this druid culture uh, in Scotland. And it's an oak tree. Oak tree is very interesting too because it's known as Quarcus robus, which I've always really enjoyed. Quarcus kind of reminding alluding me. Alluding of alluding, Joyce. Alluding to Joyce and also right. alluding to Gelman Murray naming the fundamental constituent of the nucleon of the atom after this word which was supposed to be a seagull crying, which was quark. Right. So Quarcus robus to me pays homage to oak trees uh, in, the, in its Latin form in that sense, but also is like a little <laughs> wink I feel like Gelman Murray might have maybe had in mind when he was naming that particle. But because the oak tree in the Druid culture was so sacred and it represented something very sacred. And uh, the Druids would have festivals with them, but in this particular archaeolo archaeological find called Seahenge, the tree was buried upside down as a kind of 
I don't know if, they don't know entirely if it was a pyre or not, but it was then circled by these staves, these giant wooden staves, like Stonehenge. And uh, the whole canopy that was the tree in the sky is now upside down, and the roots are coming up. And this was some kind of altar or some kind of sacred site. And it was a big undertaking, a monolithic undertaking with Especially wood. Especially for that time. Yeah, uh, for that time, because we're talking 11,000 uh, years ago or so. I mean, not, not yesterday. Um, but that always yeah, struck me as really interesting because these, uh, these understandings of reality are being literally flipped on their head in a fun way when, when the consensus view of this grouping of Druids in Scotland at that time was that they were putting a tree into the underworld. So they were literally taking this tree, flipping it, and putting it into um, another world, which was thought to be this inverted domain that was underneath your feet as you walked. It was literally another reality perceived by these druids. And that to me is really beautiful that humanity is capable of these mythologies and capable of these things. And I'm always feeding off of these things in my practice. They're sort of things that inspire stories that I write and just ideas that inspire me in general are these, these structures that I feel like, um, I think the role has sort of transferred from any shaman or druid or from any past uh, leader in, in creativity I think it's been thrown to the art teacher now, or like the artist, or anyone practicing creative gestures on this planet right now. It's like, that's the switch. It's gone from this really sacred place to this very secular place, but the secular domain is just free game for whatever the fuck you want. It is lovely. You can do anything you like, anything at all. You can have ship crashes, you can drink plane wine, crashes. plane crashes. You can, uh, you can talk about just about anything now, and you can enjoy it, and you can make it as sacred as you like, and people will appreciate it. Now, I've heard from many of your critics that you're among the 1% of functioning lunatics. 